Hello lovely people. I have been really enjoying taking part in Nonfiction November so far, and the book I'm currently reading for it is Spirals in Time, The Secret Life and Curious Afterlife of Seashells by Helen Scales. And this is a natural history book, but it is making me think a lot about some of the nature writing that I have read. So I just thought I would do a quick run through of some nature writing recommendations. Um, I always hesitate to put videos like this together because um, I think I always have so many books on my radar that I want to explore further that I think would work really well in videos like this and then I just put off recording them because I haven't read those books and then nothing ever happens. So I thought this might be a good little touch base, um, run through the ones I have already read and then I can always revisit this at a later date and add some things on. But um, just to briefly talk about the book that I am currently reading, um, this is all about seashells, both um, how they're made, the types of creatures that make them, their role in cultures through time, like all sorts of stuff like this. I'm only about a quarter of the way through it so far, but I'm really, really enjoying it and I'm finding it very illuminating. I think there's a whole world of nature writing and natural history writing that just explores topics and delves really deeply into them and I think that's really fabulous. So this is definitely one that so far I would recommend and I just thought I would mention it because it was the inspiration for me recording this. Some of these will be very well known to you already because they're very big in the nature writing world. Some of them might be um, slightly more unknown to you. So I just thought I'd go for a little bit of a mix. So to dive into it, I'm going to start with Two Trees Make a Forest by Jessica J. Lee on memory, migration and Taiwan. I actually did a whole video review of this, which I will link down below if you'd like to watch that. But um, this is a combination of nature writing and memoir. So Jessica J. Lee is kind of um, piecing together her family's history. They originally moved from China to Taiwan and then her family moved. So she lived in Canada and in Britain. The reason it's on memory migration in Taiwan is she's tracing her family's history and their migration. She's telling you a lot about the landscape of, tai of Taiwan, but also um, her grandfather has dementia. And so there is a lot of this that is ruminating upon memory and that translates itself into the nature writing. So she revisits Taiwan and she talks a lot about how her memories of the place uh, interact with her experience returning to the place, how her mother um, connects to this place after so long. And it's also split into sections. So there's like earth, air, that kind of stuff. Like one of the sections that I found really interesting was learning about like the tectonic movements that affect Taiwan and its landscape. There was a bit about the history of botany as relating to Taiwan and stuff like this. It was just super duper interesting. I really enjoyed it. I found it very like reflective. It made me really think about a lot of things. The book that you most likely will already be aware of, but which is one of my absolute favourites, is Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge and the Teachings of Plants by Robin Wall Kimmerer. This is very well loved, I know. This Robin Wall Kimmerer is a member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation and she is a botanist and she's kind of combining her scientific understanding of plants with the indigenous way of interacting with the world and this is a series of essays that all explore lots of different topics. I found it deeply affecting. I think it is beautifully written. There's a poeticism here as well as a lot of very fascinating scientific knowledge. One of the essays that I always quote to people when I try to describe what this book is like is one very near the beginning where she says she always wondered why um, these two plants grow together. Um, is it because they look more beautiful when they grow together? And that was kind of dismissed from a scientific perspective, but actually when you look into it, the answer is yes, because the, they're purple and yellow. When those colours grow together, insects are more drawn to both plants than they are when they grow independently of each other. Like, that's just so fascinating. I also really loved her other book, Gathering Moss, which is all about moss. Um, I don't have it with me because I have lent it out. That's how much I love it. I recommend it to people all the time. Um, Gathering Moss was also a collection of essays. It definitely felt um, even heavier on the science, which I really enjoyed. I'm not naturally a scientific person, so I, I definitely at times um, appreciated all the knowledge I was getting because there were a lot of like diagrams and stuff like that, which were really helpful. I have a real soft spot for moss. <laughs> it's the only book about moss I've ever read. So if you have any other moss book recommendations, I would love them. But um, yeah, from more camera on, on the whole, I would just definitely always recommend. The next two authors I want to talk about are two who were kind of some of my first experiences of nature writing and who really got me into it. Um, they're also very well known. <laughs> 
So this is Hatches for Hawks by Helen MacDonald. A lot of people love this book. It is it is very well known. But it was one of my first experiences of trying out non-fiction that was to do with the natural world. So this is an exploration of um, Helen MacDonald um, dealing with the grief of losing her father. And in the wake of that passing, she decided to train a gosh orc. So it is very much about gosh orcs and how training them went. It's very much about her dealing with her grief. There's also like a parallel um, plot point running throughout this, which is all about T.H. White, the author, um, and his attitude towards chaining gosh orcs, which was deeply, deeply wrong. But like, there's a weird, I might like, I find myself really feeling for him. <laughs> a lot of these books tackle more than just writing about nature, but I just think this one is so wonderful. I think this exploration of grief, but also this exploration of the countryside, this exploration of um, this creature that I didn't know anything about before going into this. Um, it was definitely a book that really opened my eyes to the fact that I could enjoy this type of writing. And then the next book that also then solidified that is Meadowland by John Lewis Stemple, The Private Life of an English Field. John Lewis Stemple lives um, sort of in the border between uh, England and Wales. This is just tracing the year of a meadow that is land that he owns um, just as the seasons go by. This is definitely one that is nice to dip in and out of because it is a lot of ponderings and musings. I've read quite a lot of John Lewis Stemple's work by now. There's one where he um, decides to live off of the land for a whole year, like he's not allowed to buy any food. Everything he eats he has to like forage or hunt, that kind of thing. And that was quite like a diary entry style and occasionally that felt a little fragmented for me. Whereas I think because this was my first one um, and it's less diary entry, it's more just like little musings, the fragmentary nature kind of really worked because I sort of dipped in and out and I really started to understand that I really enjoyed nature writing. It helped that I read this at like a really gorgeous time of year. I read this like um, glorious golden spring days on the farm where I work. It's a converted farm. So um, I read a lot of this outside, like surrounded by nature and that really helped. But I found this one very readable and um, I just really enjoyed just taking one place and just exploring one place for such a length of time and getting an understanding of how it changes with the seasons, how the flora changes, how the fauna changes. Um, it was just really lovely. And the, he also does these little ones, which I think are quite good little starting points as well. This is The Glorious Life of the Oak. There's a couple of other different ones. They're very little. These, again, are little fragmentary collections. This is a mix of um, his writings on different topics to do with oak trees, little like excerpts from poems about oak trees, just like slightly looking at it both from a scientific perspective from a perspective of like how does this thing change during the year but also from like a cultural perspective what are the ideas that we associate with oak where have these ideas come from um do they still remain have they changed all that kind of thing so it's just like if you're looking to start out with nature writing um these are quite little nice ones that might be quite good to explore next up is rising ground by philip marsden a search for the spirit of place philip marsden is essentially taking you around cornwall and specifically like ritual fights in cornwall and he's he's essentially like just going around cornwall and exploring like the sense of place that has developed in all of these places like the history of these places the um geology of these places or the plants the animals just like what helps establish the sense of this place that these places have like this goes like really really far back but then also it does also like go on some more like contemporary history and that kind of thing so it's kind of a mix of um natural history social history like nature writing all that kind of thing i read it a little while ago now it was another one of my quite early books but it's one that um, I think would be really interesting to do a reread of soon. And just like approaching nature writing through looking at how a sense of place develops and how like the natural world intersects with the man-made world to create an idea of a place. The next two books kind of have a similar concept of being part memoir, part nature writing, but with two very different topics. So the first of these is The Outrun by Amy Liptrop. This is Amy Liptrop's memoir about her journey with alcoholism. So there is a lot of the, especially the first half of this, is very heavily focused on her addiction, um, which is just something I want to mention because I picked this up expecting it to be quite a lot more nature writing than it was, and it wasn't a problem for it to be more about her and her memoir. It's just I don't think I was necessarily prepared for some of this heavier discussion of addiction um, when I first went into it. So just like a word of warning that if that's something that's difficult for you to read about, you know, maybe think twice about this one, because it does delve quite heavily into it in a way that... 
um, I did feel was done very well. It's just, um, you know, nature writing recommendations, you know. <laughs> Amy Liptrop grew up on the islands of Orkney and um, initially well, as a younger person she very much like flees from them but then during this process of recovery she returns and a lot of what helps her recovery proceed is grounding herself in Orkney. My favourite parts of this were really her descriptions of um, what Orkney is like. She travels around the different islands, there's um, one of the bits that's really stayed with me is her talking about the stargazing, um, or there's all the different birds who live at Orkney. She really grounded herself in this sense of place and um, this almost like this homecoming but then also having an element of being an outsider that was a really interesting perspective to read from and also just like the culture of the islands of Orkney as well and what it's like to exist there um, how they function all that kind of thing that was really super interesting um, and then the other one that has kind of a similar concept of like weaving in memoir with um, natural history is a uh, honeybee has five openings a year of keeping bees by helen jukes helen jukes really dies into bees like in all many many forms she really looks at like our develop the development of our understanding of how bees work like or ancient cultures what were their ideas of bees and how bees functioned how did we have some of the scientific understanding that we have now of bees like how did that develop um the roles that bees have like culturally but also like how do bees how do colonies work? How do they make honey? How does all of this work? Um, all of that, like, what it's like to be a beekeeper, what it is like to be a person who, like, is responsible for this colony, and that kind of thing. All of that was super interesting. The sort of side plot in this is kind of like, she feels lost and that's why she starts keeping bees. And as this goes on, like, a romance develops between her and a person. I'm going to be wholly honest, I wasn't super interested in that aspect of it. And I think, for me, part of what it is, is a lot of what that aspect is exploring is her feeling of, of, of rootlessness, of, of not really knowing what to do with her life and that kind of thing. And that just means that, like, that's not always... Sometimes that can be something that's very easy to connect to if you've been there, absolutely. But also, it's just kind of... There wasn't... I just... I didn't really connect to it a lot of the time in this. I just... I felt like it had more of a presence than it necessarily needed to. I felt like the B sections of this were definitely stronger for me. But those sections were so interesting that I would still recommend this. I would just say, like, be aware that there's also, like, a heavy memoir aspect to this. Okay, so next up is Cottage Garden Year by Lise de Bray. Lise de Bray is a uh, flower artist. Um, she's very well known for her drawings of flowers. But she also, like, as a result, you know, is also a very competent gardener. And this traces a year in her cottage garden. She had a cottage, she developed this garden that was specifically like, you know, when you say that concept of like a cottage garden, like the images that come up in your mind, like that's very much what she created. And so this is just like a lovely walkthrough. Um, each, it has loads of these big full page illustrations. You just go through the months and she's just talking you through like what's sprouting, what's growing, what are the challenges of of maintaining this garden in this time along with all of these beautiful drawings um this was just a very like sweet and cozy bit of nature writing gave me a lot of inspiration for what i would one day hope to have my garden be like um yeah it's just really nice those are all the books i actually physically have to recommend to you i just thought i would briefly mention two books that i own but have not read yet um the first of these is the brief life of flowers by fiona stafford this is another one of those that just like explore the topic and is a bit of a compendium. It's looking at some flowers in like, like it's looking at like botany. It's looking at um, there's a lot, of, a lot of this that is to do with like how flowers have gained the associations that they have, like flowers that have become symbols for things or emblems for things. Um, I just think it sounds really lovely. I'm looking forward to reading it. And then one that is a little bit more of a scientific text is Welsh Ferns, a descriptive handbook by H.A. Hyde and A.E. Wade, which is uh, very much just like <laughs> a scientific book about ferns, <laughs> but I'm interested in it. Um, there are so many more books that I could include on this that are ones that are on my radar that I think I'm going to love, but I obviously don't want to recommend them until I have bought them and read them. However, I would love to hear from you any recommendations you have. I'm always on the lookout. 
Um, there's just like off the top of my head, like there's a bunch of mushroom books I want to read, <laughs> like Entangled Life and of Mushrooms in Morning. Um, there's just there is so many nature writing books that are on my radar that I really want to check out soon. But if you do have any that you think are particular gems, please do leave them in the comments down below. I would love to hear them. I'm sure other people would love to hear them too. Um, but yeah. And also, if you could let me know if this is a type of video that you would like to see more of, because I have a bunch of different topics that I think I could create this type of video for, and I think that element of perfectionism of not wanting to do it till I have, like, oh, but that book would be perfect for it, often holds me back. But I could definitely do more of these. I think nonfiction is a fun one to do it for, but I d could also do them for fiction. Let me know your thoughts. Please do. <laughs> Um, that's everything I want to talk about this week. As per usual, I hope you have a lovely day, and I will see you next time for something different.